Okay, we're back inside theCUBE, siliconangle.tv and siliconangle.com's flagship telecast. We go out to the events and we extract a signal from the noise and we want to find the smartest people, most entertaining people we can find to share knowledge with you and extract the signal from the noise uh, and share that with you. I'm John Furrier, the founder of siliconangle.com. I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. We're here with Kim Stevenson, who's the CIO of Intel. She gave a keynote this morning just after Dave, Dave Donatelli. We're here live at HP Discover. Kim, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks. So, uh, we were talking off camera. Uh, North, Northeastern alums. Yeah. You know, I'm having a connection. very social morning here yeah. at HP Discover. <laughs> my history with HP, now a Northeastern alumni where I went to school. Uh, I actually did get a computer science degree, uh, and I, it's on my resume, so it's <laughs> true. Um, to any other folks who want to check that uh, next job interview, I'll make sure it's on there. Well, Kim, welcome. I welcome. didn't, funny yeah. enough. <laughs> <laughs> I had an undergrad in accounting. <laughs> so, what do you think? Your keynote was fantastic. Big data was a big theme. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about uh, the reaction and what you thought about the keynote. Yeah, so um, I tried to bring to the keynote a um, the business angle of what's happening with the amount of data being created uh, and how you how that can translate into business opportunities for for basically everybody um, with a real emphasis on moving quickly. Um, the first movers are going to have a real advantage, uh, and it is complex, but the reality is we've got the ability to bring in all the data, synthesize what's important, and then, then move out. And I think the next couple years are going to be huge learning years, but I wouldn't wait. Yeah, it's absolutely, we're, we're big data fans, and, and uh, we're all over that, we love it. Um, we're pro big data. So the qu first question, I want to get your definition. Um, from your, everyone's got a different definition, how you look at big data. Tech geeks look at it a certain way, business people look at it another way. Uh, you're in kind of both sides of the fence, you're on the infrastructure side, and you also look at the apps. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, data's coming from applications, users, machines, systems. Yeah. It's a tsunami, so what is your definition of big data for the folks out there? Uh, so I think it's, it's basically all information created. And um, so whether it's, it's machine generated um, or it's uh, human generated, um, all of that information is, fits into that big data envelope. A lot of the important parts of big data though are the things, the pieces of information that we've ignored or haven't been able to contextualize in a systematic way in, up until now, up until now. And that's where you're going to get the real value. We've been working in IT on corporate decision making and workflow for a long time, yeah. um, business intelligence, but bringing in that um, contextualized human information is yeah. going to make it very We've had powerful. Pauline Nist on theCUBE, she's going to be on later today and she's going to give us probably that systems perspective. And Do you know Pauline? No, I she's don't know. She's a character. She's, yeah. she's, <laughs> yeah. pheno she's phenomenal. You're a character too. But, <laughs> 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 but she'll yeah. give us the geeky version, but I'd like to get your perspective yeah. on something that we've been talking about at, at SiliconANGLE, Wikibon, and, and inside theCUBE is um, an observation that for the first time in history, a business can actually instrument their business end to end. Yes. How they yeah. acquire them, from employees to product development to marketing to sales to service, everything, closed loop, full instrumentation, that's data. Mm -hmm. So uh, as someone who's in that CIO role today, you got to think about that. Mm -hmm. What would you share with folks, kind of where we're at, and if, if that is a premise, do you agree with it, and how would you start putting that together? Yeah, so I do agree with the premise. Um, and I, I sort of uh, look at it in terms of there are 10, 15, somewhere in that range, corporate business processes. They might be order to cash, or it might be demand generation through customer lifecycle support, whatever the case may be. Uh, and that's how I, IT really has to think about the entire system, that end-to-end -end system, and how we've been siloed over the years uh, but those interaction points at the seams of every handoff is where I think the value comes from in passing that information. So I'll give you our manufacturing example. Um, we have evolved over the last 10 years to fully automated factories. And so as a wafer is moving through the factory um, and it completes a process step, all of that data around every die on that wafer and what happened in that previous process step is transferred to the next tool so that that information is, becomes the baseline information of exactly what happened, not what was supposed to happen to the next processing. That has improved our yields in manufacturing, but in today's wafers, we're at nearly 750 terabytes of data on every wafer when it's end of production. 
And you talked about how that, uh, you gave a number of examples of how Intel is using data inside of the organization, and it's changing the metrics that you're actually using. You, you gave an, yeah. uh, an example of MTBF, you said we still measure MTBF, but that's not the primary decision-making point anymore, is it? Right, right. It, we're trying to prevent, move into that whole proactive, the predictive analytics part of that data, so that we, meantime between failures isn't the key metrics, it's when's, when do you start to see degrading and then you, re, you repair before you ever have an incident, make it totally yeah. transparent it changes to the business. the whole game on, on the execution. Uh, with that in mind, I wanted to ask you about, um, you said big data is all information. Um, Storage has been a hot sector mainly because mm -hmm. it's moving from spinning disk to you got flash, all kinds of I.O. and real-time analytics. So it's like a perfect storm around this whole data movement, kind of transformative. Um, but there's data warehouse and business intelligence systems out there that were kind of built the old way. Mm -hmm. And so as you talk about the premise that you guys are talking about on the keynote, is it a data, do I start with the databases? The collection is obviously important, right? If it's all data, you got to yeah. collect it. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you get your arms around that? Yeah, I, I think deciding what you collect, because it can be daunting. It is overwhelming the amount of data. So making that you have to make a decision on what you're going to collect based on what business decisions you're trying to drive. And you're looking for things that will create inflections in the business. Uh, you know, the traditional business intelligence, et cetera, they're all structured data. And it's not that that isn't useful, it is useful but layering on that unstructured, contextualizing that information is where you get the incremental value. And it, it could be, um, so we do stuff with um, supply allocation, um, revenue forecasting. So look at, I would say, look at the big corporate business processes and where do you need an inflection point in the level of accuracy or intelligence around those decisions, and that's where you need to start. And that's, that's hard, really because good advice a, right a lot there. of times I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> you know <Yeah>. so it's <laughs> but you said something in your keynote, you said social and big data will completely change businesses, and then yeah. the other thing you said was that most organizations really aren't using social right. you know, that right. much. And yeah. uh, then you gave some examples of, of Intel, and you know, your social media examples were good. Uh, they weren't earth shattering necessarily, but they were, they were practical. Um, and uh, some examples of big data, why do you think that so big data, I, I understand, because it's so hard, but social, you know, it was kind of in the Facebook era. You know, we got a number of IPOs, and you can debate whether or not they're good or not, but I mean, it's been around a while. Why do you think that most enterprises are so slow to hop onto social, they're still skeptics? You know, so I think history always teaches us something, and if you, if you look at brick and mortar stores at the end of the 90s into the early 2000s versus the e-commerce stores, what prompted brick and mortars to, to put up websites and do e-commerce. Yeah, they got disrupted. They got disrupted, yeah. right? And so economics I, were good too. Yeah, and so, and I, I think that that same phenomena is happening with social. Um, <clears throat> it's an investment up front, so you have to justify the investment, and the ROI calculations are, are soft. Brand fuzzy, awareness yeah. is going to go up. And so it's hard for successful traditional companies to take the leap. My contention is if they don't take that leap and use the technology and innovation that's available, they will be disrupted. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I mean, the ROI is soft because there's no real data analytics yet right. to kind of close Either that through. loop, unlike a click on a search engine, right? Mm -hmm. you get, mm -hmm. It delivers a result and, and that. So, so that's a big data opportunity. It is a big data opportunity. Yeah, especially with mobility. How does mobility yeah. affect um, the big data vision around from your from your seat? Obviously you have you know, workers out there and you have devices at the edge. Um, well, and I started saying in the simplest forms, it's just another data source and data feed. Uh, when you have to start um, analyzing the data at the point of creation though, and they're on multiple different kinds of device types, we have at Intel a concept called the compute continuum, where um, depend no difference between the experience delivered on, on whatever type of device that you happen to be on, and, uh, and we would tell you we're, um, uh, we would call the strategy port of choice for uh, the operating system layer, yeah. but that compute, that continuum of experience on device consistency is a really important aspect to taking 
all of that data in. We're here with Kim Stevenson, Intel CIO, giving a perspective on big data and just uh, IT. Um, my question that we've been debating, and we're trying to understand, this is unknown data for us um, in this whole real-time analytics, is a big, huge um, innovator. The iPad has shown C-level executives what they could actually see, and, and uh, we've heard direct anecdotal comments CIO is going to IT, give me stuff on this. Um, so that brings up the whole dashboard conversation, business mm -hmm. metrics, um, real-time analytics. So batch processing is moving to high availability and real-time. That's hard, right, with all this data that you're storing, you got to have, you got to move it in active data and there's all kinds of tiering solutions. Um, what's your view on that in terms of where that's coming from? Is it coming from IT or is it coming from the business line managers? Because we're seeing a mixed bag on that. Some saying, I wanted the business driver to be X, IT gets the request, or is IT enabling uh, that kind of uh, dashboards? Because uh, it's still early, so it's yeah, not sure. Yeah. So I'll give you my perfect MBA answer, which is it depends. <laughs> um, it you should de be a consultant. <laughs> 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 so no, it, you know, I believe IT can take real leadership by um, help helping the business to understand how you could create these dashboards. We called our social media dashboard for marketing our social cockpit, but it's a dashboard. Um, is it perfect? Probably not. Will it change in the next couple of years? Maybe the next six months? Probably so, as we learn more about. But waiting for that perfect answer is probably a bad idea. Uh, but I see a lot of businesses pushing their IT shop. I think the single biggest problem that IT organizations have is the velocity at which IT moves. It's much, much slower than the pace of business, and that is something that we have to address and fix. What would you share with other IT uh, executives and leaders out there around how to position themselves and prepare themselves for the big data movement? Like you said, it's inevitable, it's coming. Yeah, um, yeah. What, what, what steps do you take for the folks out there who are kicking the tires, knowing they got to jump into the big data paradigm and start rethinking the value chain of their business? It, yeah, and maybe you could answer in the context of that last statement that you made about the misalignment of the velocity of business versus IT. Yeah, so, um, uh, the first thing I tell people, so cloud is your opportunity to, people talk about ROI for cloud and asset utilization and all of that's true. But the real opportunity for cloud is the velocity at which you can operate. So you'll have a provisioned infrastructure with the storage, the network, the compute available, and then you're just layering on the applications. That'll cut out an enormous amount of time in what IT can deliver to the business. So I do think that uh, there's opportunities to close that gap between the business and uh, the way IT moves, but I think back to the data question, uh, I, would, I would pick a few areas that um, the company needs better information and I would focus on bringing in that contextualized human information from non-traditional sources. People call it unstructured data and adding that context is probably the single biggest thing to get you a seat at the table. So I talk a lot about the IT labor problem and if mm -hmm. you look at the, the amount that's spent on labor over the last 10 or 15 years, it's, it's escalating. It's probably two thirds of the spend mm -hmm. in, uh, around IT and everybody talks about 70% goes toward running the business, 30% goes to managing the business and so you've got these decades of complex processes built out that, that have been hardened. So you remember we went through the business process redesign phase. Do mm -hmm. we have to go through an IT process redesign, maybe around data, to actually attack that problem and solve that agility alignment issue? Yeah. Well, um, some companies have, over the last few years, they've gone through data center consolidation, apps rationalization. Uh, so if you're, if you're already there, mm -hmm. um, we've made some investments to modernize our core enterprise applications, uh, as an example. <laughs> that gives us a lot of flexibility. If you haven't made those decisions, you're going to have to make those decisions. And so it's a, you're going to play catch up for a little while. So do, mo do, 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 in your view, do modernizing applications through the use of new tools and, and new practices, does that cut away at that sort of legacy process base? Or are we going to see similar types of um, calluses built up around those processes? I, I think it's going to cut away yeah, at it. Okay. Um, but it's, you have to keep looking out. Are you, um, 
continuously moving forward. It isn't a one step, so it's not like a stair step. You do this once and boom, you're there. Uh, it's, it's a continuous, we have a pretty good appetite at Intel for um, innovative startup firms and we bring a lot of companies in to, to look at their technology. Some we use, some we don't use, but part of that is cultural to build, keep pushing ourselves. And that's that's one thing I think is never done in an IT organization. Pat Gelsinger said in the cube, you know, Pat Gelsinger, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the icon. He said that Intel marches at the cadence of Moore's law, um, mm -hmm. and so does Intel uh, IT march at the cadence of Moore, Moore's law? And has that helped with your alignment? Yeah, it it does. I mean, it, we um, <clears throat> as we've we not only march at the cadence of Moore's law now, uh, but we, with different products in silicon, um, core silicon products as well as system on chip products, we now have shortened cycle times, mm -hmm. and so we're moving twice as fast. And um, I wouldn't say that we've conquered the keep up the pace of the business in IT yet, but I think that we've made great improvement, uh, and it's recognized by our business. Yeah, that's unit. really the point of my question. I mean, I think Intel is inherently more aligned be because of that. Yeah. Now. You've got other complexities, you know, <laughs> size and velocity of your business, <laughs> but uh, but I think that uh, you've compensated a lot of those just through your mission, you know, and yeah. your focus. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're really excited to speak with you again. We're fans of big data. We built our media business from the ground up on big data. We use we actually use predictive analytics mm -hmm. as a way to identify trend data within our our target verticals to write our stories, and uh, because of that, we don't have to do any banner advertising, and funds our uh, the data acquisition funds the operation, so yeah. we're completely built from the ground up, so we can tell you, uh, for example, uh, in our business, we can say, we can look at what's being consumed and what the target audience in our community are actually talking about mm -hmm. at the, in real time. Mm -hmm. And this changed our business because it reduces our risk for accuracy of stories. Yeah, so w one of the things that I uh, said this morning and believe is that um, we're heading the, the place where corporate decision making is going to change the way it happens. So if I asked you a question about when you see that your um, readers and followers don't agree with something you print out, what decisions do you take with that data? Um, well, for us, we've looked at the social crowdsourcing. One, we're instrumenting the crowd that we're, we're serving. Something you talked um, about in your yeah. keynote. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So, we're yeah. so first we have to do is yeah. instrument the crowd that we're serving. At the same time, we recognize that the crowd is part of the production process. Yeah. Unlike the New York Times, which feeds them an opinion and a story, news, they don't really take them into account in the production process. So mm -hmm. for us, we mm -hmm. actually uh, write stories. We'll reiterate, we'll follow up, we'll write multiple follow-ups. And so we look at the crowd as a production element in our operating yeah, process. Ask the crowd yeah. what they think. Right? Yeah. And so, yeah. so and we, I said we were experimenting with crowdsourcing, and um, and we're find, uh, finding that that I'll say the critical few are really powerful to listen to and take action based on. So we've we've found our IT organization has found through um, these crowdsourcing applications that we're rolling out how to isolate the true, um, highly skilled individuals from the herd. And that's a really yeah. powerful yeah, the so blended technique. The so blended average of sentiment is, you know, yeah. like makes you revert yeah. to I'm the mean. I'm going to show you this dashboard yeah. just to uh -huh. give you a little taste. Uh -huh. So we have an audience of 2.5 million unique users that we've identified as our audience. Mm -hmm. And that's now basically a panel. So yeah. in real time, we can see what's trending within our audience. Mm -hmm. And on this side is a clustered uh, community, community classification. Yeah. And so I can pull up at any given time, you want to talk about Hadoop, because we'll be at Hadoop Summit next week, I can pull up everyone who's in uh, the Hadoop classification. These are people, these are real people. Yeah. So in our, in our 2.5 million, this is the Hadoop sample. Mm -hmm. I randomly pick, just picked this random guy, see what he is. You can see that, that these are like real people. So these are like mm -hmm. a, a panel, but we're not out there trying to grab them and sell them something. This guy's a data engineer uh, for JWire, employed, employing Hadoop technologies. So he's a data guy. So, yeah. so we don't yet figure it out how to, <laughs> like we don't want to go out there and just grab them and try to, try to but we monitor them. Yeah. We, we harvest their conversations, look at their sentiment, figure yeah. out what's going on, yeah. and we can ping them once in a while. But again, this helps us data. So I'm, I'm a big believer that the instrumentation is hard yeah. right now. So that's why I think the database angle and this whole flash technology is interesting because the storage seems to be the bottleneck, the storage in the network. 
Mm -hmm. And you talk mm -hmm. about social plus data transforming businesses. Yeah. You know, we lived that, so we it resonated really well with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, how, how about HP? I mean, wh why are you here? What, what's uh, what's what, what draws you to HP Discover? So, um, you know, Intel and HP, we have we have a very strategic, close relationship. Have for years and years and years. Uh, um, they're our biggest customer, uh, but I, am, as the CIO, right, I'm here because we, we partner really closely with HP to help uh, improve what we do with Intel, and their, their infrastructure is key. It's key to my operations, so um, I wanted to be able to share some of the things that we've done and help them and, and you know. Learn in return. So, yeah. what, so what cutting edge stuff are you deploying that you can share with the folks out there? Because obviously Intel, you guys, of Moore's Law, but you also have to push the envelope and I demonstrate do. the leading technologies. Uh, what's on the, what do you have in production that's what would be quote bleeding edge? Yeah, that's so, exciting you right now. Um, we, um, we have two um, environments that you would call cloud. Um, one is for our office and enterprise applications. And uh, um, we've got 70, almost 75% of that environment virtualized and uh, all in the cloud, and we are provisioning services, new applications in that uh, environment in under an hour. And so that impacts all Intel employees because it's, it's, it's the office and enterprise application suite. And we had to instrument that. We've been at this since 2009, middle of 2009, and we had to instrument uh, and automate the entire path to production and then we extended that into our DMZ. So all of our external feeds coming in are also operating in, the, in that same cloud environment, same architecture, but it's a different instance in the DMZ. Very proud of that and has really dramatically um, changed the way we operate. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We run an application store um, at Intel. It's called AppUp. And um, we launched Angry Birds. So. We knew marketing was going to launch Angry Birds. We'd worked closely with them. They expected the capacity to go up. We provisioned in our cloud the capacity to go up. And um, however, when you give out Angry Birds for free, you get a lot more downloads than you can expect. <laughs> so, um, so you know, we we came to this screeching halt, long queues, and because we were in that cloud environment we were able to provision up that capacity. Even though it was unpredictable how much it was, we were able to provision that up. It took about 24 hours to clear the entire queue because it happened so fast. And we've been learning from that experience ever since. So now we're taking that office and enterprise environment and we're bursting it out into the public cloud to uh, create even more of that burst capacity uh, so that that won't happen again. Our second cloud environment is really for our product development, our design engineers, and that is um, a massive compute in infrastructure, almost 50,000 servers, hung together, what I would call a grid in old parlance, but a, uh, basically a clustered type of cloud that, that allows us to um, improve the throughput time of every engineering job that happens and Intel. Okay, Kim Stevenson, we got we're getting the hook. Intel CIO, <laughs> thanks for sharing inside the cube. Great to have you. Uh, we got love the conversation. We can go for another half hour. It's so exciting. Great. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and your perspective. We'll be right back with our next guest after this break. Thank you.